Question one, work out 1,449 divided by 23. Now we could do long division, but since this is a multiple choice question, we have a few choices that we can choose from. But we don't actually have to do the whole thing because if we look at the last digits, we can see that we're doing nine divided by three to get the last digit of the number that we're looking for. And nine divided by three is three. So the last digit should be three. Therefore, the only option that works here is option B, which is 63. What we can do to check, though, is we could multiply 63 by 23 and see, does it give us 1,449 or not? So we can do that on the side. 63 multiplied by 23. 3 times 3 is 9. 6 times 3 is 18. 0. 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times 6 is 12. Then you can add these. So you've got 9 add 0 is 9. 8 add 6 is 14. So we've got 4 extra 1. 1 add 2 is 3. Add the 1 is 4. And 1 is carried over. So we can see here that we got an answer of 1449, which is the same as what we started with. Therefore, option B must be correct anyway. Question two, which of the following numbers has the largest value? First, let's look at the units column. Here we've got zero units, zero units, zero units, zero units, zero units. So let's go then to the tenths column. Here we've got six tenths, zero tenths. So this can't be the biggest. Six tenths, six tenths, zero tenths again. So this can't be the biggest. Six tenths. Okay, so now we've got three that we can compare. Then let's look at the hundredths, which is technically the digit after this. Here it's worth zero hundredths, zero hundredths, zero hundredths. No competition there. Then we need to go to the next column. So let's look at the thousandths. This still has zero thousandths. The reason why I can add zeros is because 0 0.6 is saying that there are only six tenths. That means how many hundredths do we have? Zero. How many thousandths do we have? Zero. So 0 0.600, 0, we're looking at the thousandths column now. This is zero thousandths, one thousandth, zero thousandths. So in the third column, we have identified after the decimal point that it is this number, which is the biggest. That means the answer is option D. Moving on to number three, calculate the angle marked with the letter X. Now to solve this question, there's a very important rule that we have to remember, which is that the total interior angles of any triangle, so any three-sided shape, it has to total 180 degrees. So if we look at this angle X, this angle of 43 degrees and this angle of 52 degrees, all of them added together must make 180 degrees. So we're saying X degrees add 43 degrees, add 52 degrees equals 180 degrees. Now the 43 degrees and the 52 degrees, we can just add together and say that this is the same as 95 degrees. So we could rewrite this line and say, or X degrees add 95 degrees equals 180 degrees. In other words, X is the difference between 95 degrees and 180 degrees. Now, if this was 90 degrees, we know that 90 add 90 or 90 times 2 makes 180. But this is 95. So if we're saying 95 add what makes 180, well, it has to be 5 less than 90. So therefore, it should be 85 x degrees equals to 180 degrees, take away 95 degrees. Visually, this also makes sense because x up here is the whole thing, 180, take away the total of these two. Question four, what is 0 0.78 as a percentage? If 0 0.75 we know is 3 quarters or 75%, 0 0.78 is very close to that. So it's 78%, but let's break this down a little bit. The first digit after the decimal point is equivalent to seven tenths. This next digit is equivalent to eight hundredths. 
Now we can rewrite seven tenths as out of hundreds by multiplying both the numerator and the denominator by 10. So the fraction is still equivalent to the original. This way I could say seven tenths is the same as 70 hundredths. Now what happens if we add 70 hundredths to eight hundredths? Let's add these two together. That equals to 78 hundredths. We're saying 78 out of 100 and percent literally means out of 100. So 78 out of 100 means 78 percent. Now we need to be really careful here not to select 0.78 percent because that is saying that this is less than 1%. 0. Point something is less than 1%. This is 100 times smaller than the answer that we're looking for. So 0. 0.78 as a percentage is not simply saying, let's just put a percentage sign on the end of this. Where one whole would be 1.0, 0. 0. 0.78 is most of the way there. So it's equivalent to 78 out of 100 or 78%. Five, the number of letters in the word paste that have line symmetry is, and we've got five options, five, four, three, two, one. So let's look at P first of all. Does it have any lines of symmetry? Nope, because I can't fold it in half in any direction and there is no symmetry here at all. If we look at the letter A, then there is a line of symmetry because if I zoom in on the letter A, you'll see that there is a vertical line of symmetry. I can fold it in half like that. And either side would be the same. A has a line of symmetry. Then let's look at S. Now S is a special one because S does have symmetry, but not line symmetry. If I take the letter S, I can't chop it vertically and expect it to be the same on both halves. I can't chop it horizontally and expect it to be the same on both halves. I can't chop it in any direction. I can't have a line of symmetry anywhere. However, the type of symmetry that the letter S does have is called rotational symmetry, which is when you can turn something and it will look the same in another position. So if I turn the letter S upside down, or if you try turning your head upside down, you'll see that the letter S looks the same when turned upside down on its head. That wasn't the case for any of these other letters like P and A. So S does have rotational symmetry, which is another type of symmetry, but not line symmetry, which is the one that we are looking for. Moving on to the T, T does have a line of symmetry because I can chop it vertically. So T has a line of symmetry. And finally, E also has a line of symmetry because if I zoom in on the letter E, you can see that I can chop it horizontally, and then the top half reflects exactly onto the bottom half. So E also has a line of symmetry. We've got three ticks here. Three of these letters have lines of symmetry. Therefore, the answer is C. Six, 11 pencils cost £4.95. How much would seven pencils cost? If 11 pencils cost £4.95, first let's work out the cost of one pencil. If the total is £4.95, we need to divide this by 11 to find the cost of one pencil. So £4.95 in pennies is 495 pennies. Let's divide that by 11. How many 11s go into four? Well, it's too big. It doesn't go into four. How many 11s go into 49? Four 11s go into 49. 11 times four is 44 and a remainder of five. Then 11 times five is 55, which means that one pencil costs 45p. We need to find the total cost of seven pencils. So we need to do 45 times seven. Five times seven is 35. So five extra three. Four sevens are 28, add the three is 31. But remember this whole thing was in pennies. So this is 315p, in other words, three pounds 15. Therefore the answer is D. Now at the second last stage, when we were saying it's going to be 45 times seven, at this stage, if there was only one option with the last digit is five, that had to be the correct answer because five times seven is 35. So the last digit was a five. The reason why I went ahead and did this multiplication is because there were two options that had the last digit as five. 
So to check, I did the multiplication and it came to 315p, which is £3.15. Seven, here is a list of numbers, 5, 8, 9, 11, 12, 13, 17, 18, 20. Which numbers in the list are factors of 40? Well, let's list the factors of 40 since we're at this. Factors are numbers which go into the main big number. So you can divide the main big number, in this case 40, by a factor and it will leave no remainder. In other words, 40 must be a multiple of the factor. So let's look at the factors of 40. We can have 1 times 40 is 40. Let's go up a bit. 2 times 20 is 40. 3 is not a factor of 40, but we could say 4 times 10 is 40. We could say 5 times 8 is 40. We've reached the middle, really, so there aren't any more factors of 40. Now let's see which of the numbers in the list above are in common with the list of factors we've got here. 5 is a factor of 40. 8 is a factor of 40, 9 is not, 11 is not, 12 is not, 13 is not, 17 is not, 18 is not, and 20 is. So we've got 5, 8, and 20. That looks exactly like option E. Now, of course, for the sake of this question, we didn't need to write out all of the factors. I just went through this since we're on this question. But in an exam situation, you would just go through these numbers and think, which of these can I divide 40 by and get no remainder? So then hopefully you'd come to the same conclusion that the numbers are indeed 5 and 8 and 20, whereas the other ones do not work. 7b says, how many of the numbers in the list are multiples of 3? Which of these numbers are in the 3 times table? If they're in the 3 times table, then I'll write a little number 3 underneath it. So 5 is not, 8 is not, 9 is, because 3 times 3 is 9, 11 is not, 12 is because 3 times 4 is 12, 13 and 17 are not in the 3 times table, 18 is in the 3 times table because 6 times 3 is 18, and 20 is not a multiple of 3 either. So we've got three different numbers, 9, 12 and 18, which are in the 3 times table. So when it says how many of the numbers in the list are multiples of 3, the answer must be 3. Note that there's a slight difference between A and B. A literally asked us to state the numbers and B was asking how many numbers. So if this was not multiple choice, we'd have to be careful to see what exactly they're asking. Question eight, change 45% to a fraction in its simplest form. Now we said a little earlier that percent means out of 100. So if we've got 45%, then we're saying 45 out of 100. That is an accurate conversion from a percentage to a fraction. However, that is not the simplest form. The simplest form is when you can't divide the numerator and the denominator by anything further that they have in common. Now, here they do have factors in common because you can divide the top and bottom both by 5, for example. So if we divide the top by 5, we're left with 9. And if we divide the bottom by 5, we're left with 20. So 9 twentieths is actually the same fraction in terms of it being equivalent to 45 over 100, but it's been simplified from the original. Now with 9 over 20, can we simplify any further? The answer is no, because there aren't any other common factors. Factors of 9 are 1, 9 and 3. Factors of 20 are 1, 22, 10, 4, 5. You'll notice that apart from one, there aren't any other numbers we can divide top and bottom by. And so 9 twentieths must be the correct answer. Nine, find the perimeter of this square. All we're told about the square is that it has an area of 49 centimeters squared. The way that we work out the area of a 2D shape, in this case, a square or a rectangle, is that we multiply the two perpendicular dimensions so the length times the width, that gives us the value for the area. So since this is a square, this has four equal sides. That means that this side is the same length as this side. So the two sides that we're multiplying to get 49 are in fact the same number. Now 49 is a square number, seven times seven makes 49. Therefore, that has to be the value of each dimension here. So far, we've been talking about area. 
This, however, asked about perimeter. Perimeter is the distance all the way around the shape. So you've got seven, seven. Although we haven't labeled this, this is also seven. It's the same as the top. And although we haven't labeled this, it's also the same as what we've got on the left. So seven add seven add seven add seven is the same as seven times four, which is 28. Of course, the unit is indeed centimeters because we're doing perimeter. Here we were doing area, that's why this was centimeters squared. Question 10, find the value of 89.1, take away 36.55. 89.1, take away 36.55. Now in terms of place value, you'll notice that there's a number missing here. That is just going to be a zero because we've got zero hundredths there, so we can fill in the zero. Now let's do the subtraction. Zero, take away five, you can't do. So we borrow from the one, this becomes a zero, this becomes 10. 10 take away five is five. Zero take away five again, not working. So nine becomes eight. Here we've got 10 take away five is five. Decimal point stays where it is. Eight take away six is two. And eight take away three is five. Therefore, the answer is 52.55. You'll notice that after the decimal point, I'm saying the digits individually, like five, five. The reason is so that we don't confuse it with the numbers that are to the left of the decimal point. Question 11, how many seconds are there in a day? Now let's work our way upwards. How many seconds are there in a minute? There are 60 seconds in a minute. You've got 60 minutes in an hour, so we then need to multiply by 60. That should give you the number of seconds in an hour, but we need to get to a day. So we need to see how many lots of an hour do we have in a day? And the answer to that is 24. So 60 seconds in one minute, 60 of those minutes make an hour, 24 of those hours make one day. So the total number of seconds in a day is going to be 60 times 60 times 24. Now, instead of doing loads of rounds of long multiplication, what we can do is say 60 times 60 is 3,600. And how do we know that? Because six times six is 36, it's a square number. We've got these two extra zeros on the end, which means we're multiplying by 10, multiplying by 10 again. In other words, we're multiplying this by 100. So 60 times 60 is like 36 with two zeros on the end. We're multiplying that by 24. You'll notice that what we can do is just a multiplication of 36 times 24 and put the two zeros on the end again. Now, because this is multiple choice, we don't actually need to work out the full thing. We know that the product of these two numbers has to have two zeros on the end. So C is not an option, D is not an option. The third last digit has to end in a four because we've got six times four making 24 over here. So A is not an option either. And between B and E, it can't be B, which is less than 3,600. It has to be E because this number is going to be huge. If we estimate, we can say 3,000 to the nearest thousand is 4,000. And 24 to the nearest 10 is 20. Now, if we do 4,000 times 20, we're getting 80,000. So we're expecting an answer near 80,000 anyway. And so it makes even more sense that E is the answer. However, if you're still curious about 36 times 24 and the full working out, we could do 36 times 24 as long multiplication. So 6 times 4 is 24. We've got an extra 2. 3 times 4 is 12. Add that 2 makes 14. Then 0 underneath. 2 times 6 is 12. So 2 extra 1. 3 times 2 is 6. Add the 1 is 7. Now we need to add these up. 4 add 0 is 4, 4 add 2 is 6, and 1 add 7 is 8. This gives us the 864 that we need at the start of the number. But remember, we had these two extra zeros. That's why we've got these two extra zeros here as well. Question 12. Find n if 126 divided by n equals 9. Well, this is the same as saying that 126 divided by 9 equals n. Because n times 9 makes 126. So 9n, as we say in algebra, equals 126. So we need to do 126 divided by 9. 
How many times does nine go into one? It doesn't. How many times does nine go into 12? Once with an extra three left over. Nine times four makes 36 nicely, no remainder. Therefore, the answer is A, 14. Now, what we do in algebra, which is the branch of maths where we're dealing with an unknown letter that represents a numerical value, is we can substitute this value, 14, back into the position of n and see if it makes sense or not. So can I say 126 divided by 14 equals 9? Yes, I can. If I couldn't, then I can't just replace n with 14. 13, simplify the expression 4c minus 6d plus 2c plus 3d. This is still the topic of algebra, which is where we're dealing with these letters that have unknown values. What we do in a case like this is we collect what we call like terms, so things that have the same property. These c's, the 4c and the 2c, these are part of the same family. So we can say 4c add 2c, this together makes... 6c. Meanwhile, let's look at minus 6d and 3d. These are in the d family. So if you look at the minus 6 plus 3, if you add those together, you've ended up with minus 3 because we started off in minus 6. Since then, we've added 3. So now we're still on a negative number. We're still on minus 3. So in the D family, this is worth minus 3D. So now we just need to put these together. We've got 6C and we've got minus 3D, which is option A. 14, a bag contains 12 red, 17 blue, 10 orange, and 21 black counters. You pick a counter without looking inside. What is the probability that you select a red counter? To work out a probability as a fraction, we have a numerator and a denominator. The denominator is the total number of outcomes, or in this case, the total number of counters, whereas the numerator is the outcome that we are selecting. In this case, the outcome is picking a red counter. So how many red counters are there? There are 12 red counters. So we can pick 12 out of a total of What's the total of all these numbers? 12 add 17 is 29. Add 10 is 39. Add 21 is 60. So we've got 12 out of 60. This is correct as the probability of picking a red counter out of all of the counters. However, we can simplify this fraction, which means we divide top and bottom by a common factor. In this case, we can actually go as far as dividing top and bottom by 12, since 12 is a factor of 60. 60 is a multiple of 12. If we divide the top by 12, we're left with 1. If we divide the bottom by 12, we're left with 5. This is the same as 1 fifth, which is option D. 14B says, what is the probability that it is not an orange counter? Firstly, let's say, what is the probability that it is an orange counter? Well, the orange counters make up 10 counters out of 60. 10 out of 60 we can simplify and just say one out of six because we can divide top and bottom by 10. But that's the probability it is an orange counter. We don't want it to be an orange counter. The probability of it not being an orange counter is all these other combinations. So the red and the blue and the black. In other words, the 50 out of 60 that are not orange because 10 out of 60 were orange. 50 out of 60, again, we can divide top and bottom by 10 to be left with 5 sixths. The really important thing here is that the 1 sixth add the 5 sixths make 6 sixths, which is a bit hard to say, but that means it's equivalent to one whole. That should cover all the possibilities. The probability of it being orange and the probability of it being not orange all of those chances have to add up to one, which is the total. 15, calculate the area of the trapezium. First of all, we can think what's the formula for the area of a trapezium. It is the average of the two parallel side lengths, which means that we add these two together and divide by two. Then we multiply that by the perpendicular height, in this case, five. So if we take the halfway point in eight and 12, then it's 10. 
10 times 5 gives us 50. So what we're saying, in other words, is that 8 add 12 divided by 2 gives the average length of the trapezium. We're then multiplying that by 5. Now, 8 add 12 was 20. Divide that by 2 is 10. So this is 10 times 5, which is 50. There's something else that we can do to check this, which is to work out the individual areas and then add them up. So we could treat it like a compound shape area type question. Because if we know that this whole bottom length is 12 centimeters and up to here, the rectangle is eight centimeters long, that means here the length of the rectangle is also eight. This leftover extra bit, the base of the triangle must therefore be 12 take away eight, which is four. Similarly, because the height of the rectangle is five centimeters here, the height of this triangle is also five. Now this is going to help us to work out the individual areas of the shapes. Because if we look at the rectangle here, it's just eight times five, which is 40 unit is centimeters squared. Meanwhile, we've got this triangle down here. Five times four is 20, but that's if it was actually a rectangle. This triangle is half of the rectangle that this would have been if it was just five times four, which is 20. So actually the area of the triangle is half the rectangle that it sits in. So we're doing five times four divided by two. Five times four is 20, but this is half of it, which is 10 centimeters squared. Now, if we add this 40 centimeters squared to this 10 centimeters squared, what do we get? The same thing, 50 centimeters squared. 16, convert 5,300 grams to kilograms. Well, firstly, we know that 1,000 grams equals to one kilogram. So 5,000 grams must equal to five kilograms. In other words, to get from the number of grams to the number of kilograms, we divide by a thousand. So if we've got 5,300 grams, we need to divide that by a thousand to get to the number of kilograms. So if we start off with 5,300, divide that by a thousand, we end up with 5.3. Because this is saying we have five kilograms, each with a thousand grams, that's 5,000 grams. And then the point three is saying 300 grams. So 5,000 grams, add 300 grams, makes 5,300 grams. So 5.3 kilograms is option D. That brings us to the end of today's session. I will be resuming tomorrow with the next part of this paper. So I'll see you then. In the meantime, if you have any more papers that you would like me to cover, then please do let me know in the comments down below. I'll try my best to cover them and I'll see you soon.